All right, let's start. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming here. Uh, today, I am here to tell you a little bit the story of my most recent hobby, uh, the prototyping of a robot arm controller. Uh, actually, the main goal of this is to learn uh, to learn more technologies in a more funny way, right? So, uh, yeah, let's start. A little bit about me. My name is Enrique Llerena Dominguez. I'm a software developer. Uh, yeah, I have been developing software for finance, retail, automotive, uh, pharma also. Uh, yeah, I like about software architecture, cloud computing, artificial intelligence. And on my free time, I like to watch football and develop nice things and spend time with the kids. Yeah, I work at Mimacom. This is a, a team event that we had in Mallorca last year or this year, this year. So the motivation for this project. Well, as I told you, the main thing that I want to do is to learn new stuff. Uh, initially, I wanted to learn some machine learning framework and some uh, data streaming framework, some data streaming tool, right? So the very first thing that I made was with TensorFlow, but I am not here to talk to you about TensorFlow, but about Deep Learning for J. So uh, I had a look at the, the, the projects that were developing about uh, machine learning on the Eclipse community, and I, I ran into Deep Learning for J. So I had a look at it. Um, the other thing that I was interested to learn and to play more with was and is still Gatsebo. Gatsebo. It is a simulation software. Right? So the main goal of all this is to learn and to experiment with new, uh, with new tools. But I mean, again, how, how could I learn all this? Uh, I have been doing a lot of tutorials, a lot of online courses, but I, I felt it was not enough, right? Because uh, I was just doing some uh, isolated stuff and, and I got the feeling that I, I could do more things, right? So what's the answer for it? Well, get the hands theory, let's put a project together, uh, let's come out, let's come up with something. So. Uh, during one of those courses that I made, uh, I ran into uh, this sensor. It gives you the data from the hands over it. So I was thinking maybe I can do something cool with it. And during my master, uh, I also was working on this uh, yeah, simple simulated robotic arm. So I said, Maybe I could control this uh, robotic arm with my hands, right? Just putting the hands over the sensor. So, uh, yeah, I got really passionate about it, but it wasn't enough. I needed to actually uh, justify why I wanted to do this. Uh, so well, why is this a good match? Well, on one side, it is a data stream where uh, getting data from the sensor, and we need to transform it into instructions, which is, are going to be uh, after that movement. And this is also a classification problem. We are classifying a lot of coordinates into a movement instruction. So, talking more specifically about this project, what are the objectives that I set for myself? Well, first of all, I want to control this robotic arm with the position uh, of my hands over the, over the sensor. And I also want to make possible for everyone to train a model for themselves because uh, everyone has different, uh, different tastes or yeah, they, they like to do different stuff. So it is possible, let's do it. And well, what exactly does map a hand position to a movement means? Uh, we are going to use the position of a hand and 
I want to stress this, it is a position, it is not a gesture, to control the robotic arm. How? With the left hand, oh, oops, with the right hand, uh, with the left hand, we're going to control which servo we need to move. And with the right hand, we're going to say, I need a positive or a negative delta. So far, it is a constant delta, right? So uh, this is a, an arm with three degrees of freedom. We have three servos here, here, and here. And two possibilities to move each servo, a negative and a positive delta. So exactly in like a more concrete example, this means using the hand wide open, I want to indicate to move the servo to wide, uh, wide, wide open just because I want to. It could be a fist, it could be just the thumb extended, wherever you want. And the same is for the right hand. With it, we're going to say whether we want a positive or a negative delta. Again, the position, not the gesture. So the strategy that I followed to implement this project is that I want to do a minimal viable product. It is a hobby, so let's get some stuff done. Uh, I also felt that it was really important to have small iterations because it was something new for me. So I wanted to make sure that everything works. Instead of doing big stuff and after that integrate it, I thought it was easier to do small uh, changes and make sure they work. And another important thing is that I want to tackle the most risky stuff first. So uh, speaking about the challenges, uh, on one side, we need to get the data from the sensor. On the other side, we need to model the simulated robotic arm be able to control it and communicate it with the exterior, with another processes. And in between, we need something to transform this sensor data into movement instructions. So, uh, having said that, this is the target architecture of the application. So on one side, we have the sensor framework. On the other side, we have the robot upper simulation and in between, the controller, which is going to use eventually the machine learning framework. But as I said, uh, first I want to do small changes. I want to do, I want to uh, start small and keep going. So, at the very first prototype, I didn't use the machine learning framework. So, let's talk uh, about the first piece: the reward simulation. Uh, as I told you, it is uh, on a Gazebo project. Uh, it, utilizes, it uses plugins written in C++. And yeah, on some other documents, SDFs, which are XML documents, you can uh, model of, you can model uh, all these visualization, right? You can define uh, the textures, you can define uh, all the, all the physical elements you see here and their connections. So, talking about uh, the second piece, the data from the sensor, it is a leap motion. I ran into it doing some uh, machine learning course on Cadence. It was machine learning for musicians. I wanted to do something not that usual. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you just get the the sensor, and out of the box on the framework, you get such visualization for debugging. And now, talking about the controller. It is a Java application, a Spring Boot application, and its responsibilities are to communicate the sensor with the uh, row arm simulation and to transform the hands data into instructions. So how are these components going to communicate? Well, that was a little bit tricky uh, because LibMotion actually provides frameworks 
to get the data from, from uh, for example, with Java. But those frameworks are deprecated. Anyway, I went and downloaded them and uh, gave it a try to use them, but I spent a good amount of hours uh, trying to get them to run. Uh, I couldn't link it because it was using GNI uh, with an underlying C, C library, so I was not able to link it after a couple of hours, and I was digging around and I ran into WebSockets, that the framework was providing the information through WebSockets. So, bingo, there is a way to get the data. And this is what the code to get the WebSocket, uh, to get the information from the WebSocket looks like on the Java application, right? So it is real simple using the Java WebSocket uh, framework. We just need to send on start one message, focused true, and after that we start getting the uh, the data of the hands in a JSON format. We just need to uh, get it, and after that we will uh, process it. So now, having solved that problem, the next one is how can I communicate the RoboArm controller with the RoboArm simulation? My very first try was using the command line. Why was it that? Because there was a tutorial there on Gazebo on how to control, uh, how to communicate with this C++ plugin uh, using protobufs. Uh, and an, another uh, command uh, running in another process. So this is what it looked, looked like on the, uh, on the Java side. We spin up uh, this uh, runtime, we get uh, a process, and we execute it. I tried to uh, improve this. Uh, I tried to, to make it better. I called it get it to run better, so I executed it. And it failed, miserably failed. Why? Because it is just too slow to spin up uh, this uh, command line and execute the commands every, for every movement. Remember, we are getting hundreds of, of uh, frames per second, so it was just too slow. So, um, after thinking a little bit about it, I thought we could communicate the C++ plugin with the Java application through TCP sockets. And now this is what it looks like on the Java side. Uh, we transform the data of the instruction into bytes and we write it to the uh, to a TCP socket. And it worked. It was really nice. There we had a first uh, prototype, but uh, Reaching our first goal just mm, sets us up to go to the next, to go for the next goal. And the really, the real biggest goal was to integrate machine learning. But having a basis uh, yeah, was, was really required. So coming back to the target architecture, uh, here this machine learning framework comes into play. Uh, the RoboArm controller, the Spring Boot application, is going to, to use it. And, yeah. So, to integrate machine learning, we have two phases. First of all, we need to perform the training, export the model, and after that, we need to use the model to be able to control the robotic arm. And the training itself is divided into two parts. To generate the data set, and to train the machine learning model. So talking about the training process, this is what it looks like. So first, on this part, we generate the data set. So the sensor framework pushes data to the RoboArm controller. The RoboArm controller performs internal transformation. 
And after that, it writes the training data set to a file. Once this is done, we start the training uh, with the data set. We should go here, but. Uh, so for that, we need to configure a model and we need to provide the data to the Deep Learning 4J framework. Then it will train the machine learning model and it, it is going to export uh, the, trained, the trained assets, which are two, a trained model and a normalizer. And all right, this is what the data set looks like. So we have the hand type, zero means left hand, one means right hand. We have the coordinates of the tip of each of the fingers. So we have uh, 30 numbers like, like this. And at the very end, we have the label. The meaning of the labels are this. So zero, zero, one, one, zero, two, and so on. Using this, we're able to just train one model to be able to use it to classify both hands. Uh, it will be more clear, it will be clearer when I show you guys the demo. So, now the controlling phase using the machine learning. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, the sensor framework provides, pushes the data into the RoboArm controller, the Java application. Then it, it transforms the same, it performs the same internal transformation into its internal model. And we need to perform two classifications. When we classify the left hand data, we get the servo ID to move. And when we classify the right hand data, we uh, get whether the user wants to make a positive or a negative delta. So on the data set, I mean, the, the, we, we, just, we just train one model. So the model learns that everything that is on the, on the, with the left hand will just map actually to three instructions. And everything with, this, with the right hand is going to map to, to uh, I mean, to, to different labels. I meant labels before, sorry. <coughs> So, this is going to be my favorite slide. No blah, blah. Show me the deep learning code, please. So, here we go. So, first, um, I am going to show you the code for the training phase. This is just the code related to the deep learning for day. So first, we need to load uh, the data into a data set. So we get a file, and we load it into a, into a data set. After that, we need to make the data preparation. The first step is to shuffle it, and then to normalize it. After that, we need as usual, to perform the split into test and train uh, data sets. And once that is done, we get a data set iterator here. And then we perform the, I mean, and then we create the configuration of the uh, neural network. Uh, we just have three layers, the input layer, one hidden layer, and uh, the output layer. So after that, we create the multi-layer network using the configuration that we just created. We initialize it and we perform the training. One important thing is that I needed to use the training, the data set iterator and not the data set itself. Yeah, I don't know why it didn't work. I would expect that you could pass the training, uh, I mean, the data set, and it should be able to fit it, but it didn't work. It costed 
a couple of hours of, of debugging. So uh, after that, we store uh, the model. It is really easy. And we also need to store the normalizer because we are, we're going to use it later to perform the uh, classification. And then we do the uh, evaluation with the uh, test data set and we output uh, the result of this evaluation. So, so far it is the training part and now I am going to show you the classification part. Is that big enough? So on the constructor of the class, we load the model and the normalizer. And on this function, classify, which is going to be called on every frame of, of data that the uh, sensor is pushing, is pushing, we're going to perform the, the classification. So first, we need to transform the domain model hand into the format that the Deep Learning for your framework are, is expecting, which is an ND array. So here we perform this, uh, this transformation. And then we do the prediction using the output uh, method of the model. And after that, here we get a distribution of probabilities like all the labels, like the probability of each label. So we need to get the label with the highest probabilities so that we can return it. So, I will show you the demo a little bit later, but the result is that it worked. It was really nice. Uh, to, to have it done, to see it working. I think it's a nice score, nice goal. So the biggest challenges I faced uh, using the Deep Learning for J framework, like investigating it, learning it, is, well, what I told you, what I told you earlier, uh, that I needed to use an iterator instead of the data set to train the uh, neural network. I don't know. Maybe it's because I am using the latest version, which is a beta. I think it's 1.0.0 beta. Maybe it's because of that. I don't know. Um, also, another thing is that the data on the ND array needed to be a float, a float and not a double. That also costed a couple of hours of, of debugging. Yeah, I, did, I wasn't expecting that. So, in combination with this problem, like while doing the prediction, uh, I faced the third one. Actually, I realized this was a problem when I was when I was trying to debug the prediction. So, yeah, we need to perform normalization in order for the neural network to perform well. That's, I mean, when I look now, it, it is obvious. Maybe I was naive when, when doing this. I was I was not. Uh, performing the normalization before the uh, classification. So, uh, and, and, and I mean, this this problem, my naiveness, plus the fact that the data needed to be float and not doubled, also caused a lot of of debugging issues. I mean, I think. I, I spent maybe like 12 hours to perform this spike and I'd say half of the time or maybe five hours I spent doing, I mean, trying to solve these two problems. So another not so big challenges are that the uh, empty constructor of the ND array throws a null pointer exception when we are trying to add data to it. I mean, maybe it makes sense, but yeah, it was the empty construction was 
uh, available, so I used it, and after that, yeah, it was not so clear why it was showing that. Uh, another thing is that I also realized that the data needs to be shuffled in order, uh, I mean, for the net neural network to perform well. And also, I think this is more of my problem, is that it seems to be overfitting, because when I provide less data, I get better uh, results. So now the radio is 65% of the data set goes into training, and the rest goes into test. Uh, I started doing like 80-20, and yeah, I got better results, slightly better results, like 10% or something like that, better, uh, using less data. So, uh, what is missing on this? Uh, Apache Kafka, I mean, yeah, I'm not using Kafka yet, I have not had time, this is a hobby, uh, I have just a couple of hours per month, actually not even per, per week to, to work on this, because yeah, I have children and I need to really push, push me for start doing this at 10 p.m. after the children are in bed and my wife is happy. Uh, I didn't mean that. <laughs> so, uh, more open issues on this is that the user experience is bad. I mean, you will see it on the on the demo now. To train all the stuff, we are using command uh, the command output. I mean, the command line output. Uh, you will see it now. Uh, another important problem is that the sockets in the simulation are blocking, so the simulation does nothing until it gets a message, and that's not what the real world works like, right? I mean, you are not just idling, or just waiting for a message to, to perform stuff. I mean, the, the, the time keeps going, and the reality keeps going. Uh, another thing is that we are always using the classified data, even if it does not match to a train instruction, so we are still, I mean, I am still uh, classifying garbage, let's say. And another bug uh, that I saw is that the simulation make big, makes big job, jumps of state. It was, I saw it enough times to recognize it, but not enough times to debug it and actually try to fix it. So on the what went well part, not everything are, are issues, it that I was able to uh, experiment and play with a lot of technologies. And of course, the most important of them is that I was able to do some small thing, a practical thing with deep, deep learning for j. I still need to learn a lot of stuff. I need to perform, I mean, I need to train bigger models. I need to, to still learn more about the theory underneath to be able to use uh, better methods, but yeah, at least it was some initial step. And, well, next step and opportunities, I need to evaluate which open issues are worth solved, and I need to challenge the necessity of actually using Kafka to communicate the components. Now, I have two conflicting goals. One is to learn the framework, and the other one is to do a, an efficient project. Right? So eventually I'll need to choose which one I want. At the end is my hobby, so I'm the one making the calls. And well, another interesting thing is that maybe I, want, I can use the robot operating system on top of Gatsibo. That could be another, another interesting area to go. So now, the demo. Uh, no, 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 not yet, not yet. So, a uh, 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 reminder, uh, we have three different servos. Yeah, one, two, three. Uh, which one of these is an, it's a label for the training for the data set, and a positive and a negative delta. So in total, we have five different labels. Oops, okay, now. So now comes to them. So 
So first I start the visualizer. As I told you, this comes out of the box. And after that, I'm going to start the uh, controller in training mode. So here you see I'm training and using Deep Learning for J. These are the spring profiles. So now I am training the servo one. Now I'm training the for the servo two. I mean I am uh, generating the data for the servo two. Now for the servo three. Now, this is the uh, position for the positive delta using the right hand. And now for the negative delta. Now that the data set is generated, it performs the training. Uh, yeah, we have... Uh, 89%, so normally I get like 94%. Let's see how this behaves. I mean, I think this is still uh, good enough. So where uh, I am going to use the generated uh, data set here. And now I am going to start the application in controlling mode using the deep learning for your framework. And I'm going to start the Gazebo simulation. Here you can see. I am controlling it using the the trained data. And that's it. That's it. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, you can find the code of all these in two repos on my GitHub. The first is for the whole application of the raw arm controller. Uh, you will see it on a different mar uh, on a different branch. I am yet to merge it. I will do it these days. But there are just two branches, so it's all right. And just I also created a different. A repo just for doing the spike for using the deep learning for j so if you are just interested in the deep learning for j code uh, it is there it is i just published it uh, i mean i just make the made the repo public uh, like one hour ago so should be there and yeah i mean let's connect on github or our other social networks and i am really looking for your feedback i mean either here or on GitHub, or on these emails, where you want. So, yeah, thank you very much for your attention, and do you have any questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I'll be here. Feel free to approach me with feedback and with questions, or just to have a good beer. Thank you very much.